I'm honestly not exactly sure where I should start with this. It's something I've kept silent about for over half a decade at this point, both because of the vow that we, my friends, and I made that night, and honestly, because it's been the only way I've been able to stay relatively sane since then. I already wake up almost nightly, covered in a literal sheet of sweat with my heart racing from the nightmares. That's what I spent the last several years telling myself. It was only a nightmare, nothing more, and for the most part, it seemed to work. It was, until a week ago, when I saw something which shattered that illusion into a million pieces. But, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, I guess. I should start from the beginning. You see, I live in a medium-sized coastal town in the Pacific Northwest. One which has been around since the 1850s at least. One which has developed many tales of supernatural occurrences all over it. Counts of strange occurrences have been reported for over half a century or more ranging from ghostly voices emanating from where the town's once bustling logging buildings stood on the edge of the estuary, to noises of old motion pictures playing after hours in the old Egyptian-style theater downtown, one of the last remaining in the United States, to the sounds of ghostly music and laughter coming from the ballroom of the old hotel, now converted to apartments. But one of the biggest ones, so big it used to be a centerpiece of the annual Halloween ghost tours in town, was the old hospital. Built in the mid-1920s, it served as the town's sole hospital until the early 70s when the modern one was built and the old shut down. For a short period of time between the 80s and the early 90 seconds, it housed a community college, but it, too, left, leaving it again silent and abandoned. The official reasoning given was that the structure wasn't up to proper code and the costs in bringing it up to modern standards would be just too expensive. But, as with every town, rumors spread about the real reason why nobody would occupy it for long, whispered in hushed tones by the older townsfolk, were rumors of, to put it simply, rather sinister and horrifying things which went on inside the building's walls, tales of unethical experimentations being performed on patients and volunteers from the local state hospital of doctors being involved in the occult and performing witchcraft ceremonies after hours in the basement, and of things equally as vile, which they refused to speak about out loud at all. To my friend group, all who were extremely interested in the supernatural and urban legends, the tale of the hospital was the most exciting thing about our town. Every year since we were six or seven, we'd go on the annual Halloween haunt walk, and every time the tour guide stopped us in front of the red and tan building, we'd all perk up craning our necks and looking up at the windows, hoping to catch a glimpse of some specter staring down at us. But nothing ever happened, and as the turn of the century rolled around, leading from the 2000s into the 2010s, our enthusiasm for it seemed to wane slightly. We all became wrapped up in our own personal lives, and soon, our annual meetup was forgotten about. That was, until one cold, rainy day in early 2018, I had just gotten up for the day as it was my day off from work, when my phone rang on my bedside table. Reaching over the bed, I picked it up and was surprised to see Johnny's name staring back at me. I quickly answered it. Hello. A moment later, Johnny's deep, booming voice rang through the phone. Hey, Mikey boy, how are you? I hadn't heard from my friend in almost three years since he'd gone to Eugene for college. I let out a small laugh. Dude, been a hot minute since I heard from you. I've been alright, what about you? How's school going? I sat down in my desk chair as he answered. School's been going fine. Bro, thanks for asking. His voice took on a teasing tone. I hear you're going to be turning 28 this summer, huh? I groaned. Dude, don't remind me. I'd like to pretend turning 30 wasn't only a handful of years away. He let out another laugh. Hey, how do you think I feel where I'm 35 now? My bad, man. I laughed back, then looked out the window. So, are you back in town or something? I asked. I heard him shift on the phone. Yeah, actually I am. For a week or so. That's actually the reason I called. Are you doing anything right now? I glanced at the clock. The large, white numbers showed it was a little after 10.30. Duh, not right now. Today's my day off, and I'm not meeting Ruby till tonight for dinner. A smacking sound came from my friend's end of the call. Damn it, that's right. Today's your guy's five-year anniversary. Congrats. I thanked him, and then he continued. Look, 
I called up the others a few minutes ago. We're all meeting at the diner in the strip mall parking lot down from Walmart. Come join us. I've got something for us to do for old time's sake. Now that we're all back in town, I allowed myself a small grin. Knowing Johnny, this was going to be interesting, to say the least. All right, man, just give me half an hour to get dressed and drive down there. About 35 minutes later, I pulled into the strip mall's parking lot, spying my friend's Cadillac. I parked next to it and walked into the diner. The smell of home-cooked bacon and eggs washed over me. Many of the patrons in the diner were late risers, having a breakfast while they still could. Turning to my right, I spied a hand waving over the top of the far booth. Over here, Mike, waving at Francine, the diner's owner. I strode across the tiled floor and slid into the empty spot on the red vinyl bench. Looking up, I was greeted by the three smiling faces of my friends. Hey, Mike, long time, bro, Lucas exclaimed, reaching across the booth to fist bump me. Addie gave me a small wave from the other side of him, the curls of her auburn hair bouncing slightly on her shoulders. A thick hand fell on my shoulder, and I turned to see Johnny's ginormous grin looking down at me. Hey, duty said simply. I happily exchanged greetings with them all, and after ordering a grilled cheese sandwich and a coffee, we all fell into old times, laughing and telling each other what we'd been up to since we'd last seen each other. I was the only one who'd stayed in town, working for a decent pay at the fish processing plant down the coast, and occasionally on one of the fishing boats during the summertime. Johnny had gone off to college in Eugene, while Lucas had gone off to Portland for some big-time job. Eddie had moved up to Seattle to work as a photographer. Her passion, as our food was brought to us, I realized for the first time how much I missed our friend group. How much I missed hanging out with them. I had a small group of other locals I was friends with, and of course, I had Ruby, but the dynamic the four of us shared was something nobody else could replicate. Okay, so you're all probably wondering why I gathered us all here, right? Johnny said. As we finished eating, Lucas put on a dumb expression. I thought you'd brought us here to sit and jam our thumbs up our asses. Johnny flipped him the bird with a laugh as Addie let out a giggle. Smart ass. He proclaimed, then reached into the bag next to him. No, I brought you here because I saw this yesterday. He pulled out a copy of our town's local newspaper, The World, and laid it on the table. I craned my neck to read the headline, McAuley Hospital to be demolished in coming weeks. Well, damn, Lucas said, panning over the article, then looking up. Addie leaned in for a turn to read it herself, so they're finally going to actually knock it down. She asked, looking up. Johnny shrugged his shoulders. Seems like it. They're going to turn the area into some kind of parking lot or something. According to the article, I leaned back in the booth, feeling a small wave of sadness wash over me, and said the only thing I could think of. Well, that sucks. It felt not only as though a piece of the town's history, however sordid, was about to be destroyed, but also a beloved piece of our own personal ones. The tours to the hospital had been such a staple of our childhoods that losing it almost felt like finally having to part with a childhood stuffed animal, as strange as it may seem. Johnny nodded. It does suck, but it says here it won't be torn down until early to mid-April. That means it'll still be standing, like the headline says, for a few more weeks. I sat up a little straighter, hearing something come into my friend's voice. It was almost a mischievous tone. Oh boy, he's got something planned. The other two seemed to have picked up on it as well. What are you thinking? Lucas asked him, leaning forward on his elbows. Johnny lowered his voice to make sure he couldn't be heard. I'm thinking that we never got a chance to see inside the place. So, why don't we sneak inside this weekend and check it out, make an adventure of it. Now everyone was sitting up straight and staring at him. You serious? Addie asked quietly, as a damn heart attack, he proclaimed. I let out a soft laugh. Dude, you are still as nuts as ever. He looked at me, giving his trademark grin. Don't you know it, man, he said. What about the cops, though? Lucas asked him. You know the town's been chasing the homeless out of there for years. They're likely to be on guard these next few weeks, until it's rubble. Johnny kept grinning. I know for a fact that there'll be other places this weekend, seeing as how it's Easter on Sunday. We'll have about a two hour window Sunday night where we can slip inside, look around, and slip out again without being caught. He looked around at us. So, what about it? One last hurrah. 
one last adventure with the hospital to mark the end of an era. For a second, there was no answer. Ben Lucas let out a soft laugh of his own. What the hell? Why not? I'm in. Johnny turned to look at Addie, who shrugged, giving a small smile of her own. I'm in. This is the last time we'll have the chance to see the place. Anyways, I always wanted to see inside. I became aware that everyone was now looking at me, waiting for me to give my answer. Mike, Johnny asked, for the slightest of seconds. A small part of me said it was a bad idea, especially with how gung-ho the cops in town could be. Then, I pushed it away. This might be one of the last memories we'll have together before our lives truly move apart. You'll regret this if you turn it down, man. Sure, why not? I said, grinning, yeah, I'm in. And with that, the plan was set. Later that night, as I went on my anniversary date with Ruby, I pushed the plan out of my mind, allowing myself to get lost in her beautiful blue eyes and brown hair, everything else seeming to drift away. But as I lay in bed, hearing her softly breathing next to me, I stared up at the darkened ceiling above me and wondered what I'd gotten myself into. The rest of the week seemed to pass by in a blur, and before I knew it, Sunday had arrived. As the afternoon drew on, I made a trip to my local mercantile store, picking up a few items I felt I would need for our adventure tonight. Finally, as the last remnants of daylight faded from the sky, I drove from my side of town to the other, where the others were waiting for me. As I turned onto Commercial Avenue, the headlights of my Ford Taurus bounced off the faded and peeling tan and red paint, reflecting back in the glass of the hospital, and then I passed it, driving a little farther down the street and parking across from the town park. Getting out of the car, I retrieved my items from the trunk and walked back towards the meeting spot. Many lights were still on in the neighborhood's houses, and I let out a silent prayer that nobody would gaze out of their windows and see us. The chilly spring air whipped at my face as I crossed the street until I was standing, quite literally, in the shadow of the four-story building. I stopped and looked up at it, finally for the first time in my life appreciating how big it was. It stretched up and away from me, seeming almost imposing in the gathering darkness. It almost looks like a slumbering beast in the gloom, one which could wake up at any moment. I shook my head slightly. Where the hell had that thought come from? The wind whipped at my back, and a slight shiver shot up my spine, though I didn't know whether it was from the cold or the building. That was when the hand fell on my shoulder. I about jumped a foot off the ground, choking off the cry that had bubbled up in my throat. Behind me, I heard a quiet laugh, and whirled around to see Johnny giving me a grin. You ass. I hissed at him, though I let out a soft laugh of relief. What, did I scare you? He joked, nudging my shoulder, then motioned towards the back of the building. Come on, the others are waiting around the back. He noticed my bag, and gestured to it. What you got in there? I unzipped it, opening to show him. A pair of gloves, so I don't cut myself on the glass, or metal, a flashlight, so we can see where we're going, and... I pulled a camcorder out of the bag, that to document it. He let out a low whistle, and that is why we always rely on you. My man, you always come prepared. And with that, he led me around to the back of the hospital. Lucas and Addie were indeed waiting for us near a rear window. I saw, with a small measure of disapproval, that someone, likely Johnny, or Lucas had broken the glass out. So, who's going first? Johnny whispered, looking around. I guess I'll do it Lucas whispered back after a second. He cleared away the remaining fragments of broken glass, then boosted himself up and over the window ledge until he disappeared inside. A moment later, he stuck his head back out. It's alright, come on, he said, a huge smile already formed on his face. Johnny helped Addie up next, then slid up and inside himself. For a few moments, I was left alone outside and I quickly looked around. The woods which stood behind the hospital slid away into the darkness, and I noticed for the first time how there was no sound of animals calling, no rustle of elk sliding through the woods, no owls, nothing. The realization made another shiver slide up my spine, though I couldn't tell, again, why. I scoffed. Come on, it's barely out of winter, Michael. Most animals aren't even out yet. Stop spooking yourself over some stupid BS. And with that, I reached up and grabbed the window ledge pulling myself up and sliding inside. The first thing I noticed when I stood up was just how musty it seemed to be. The air almost seemed thick, heavy laden with dust, and God only knew what else. 
hope to God I don't breathe in too much asbestos or something. I forgot to bring a mask. Reaching into my bag, I pulled out first the gloves, then the flashlight. Snapping it on, I hooded the beam slightly with my free hand and shone it around. The room which we had entered was large, and as I'd figured it would be, empty. The same tan color which adorned the outside of the building graced the walls in here. Though the floor seemed to be tiled, I could only guess what purpose it had served in the days of it being a hospital, as it had closed long before I'd been born. It could be a room for administrative purposes, or it could have been a patient room. I'll never know. That's when I noticed I was alone in the room. What the? I hadn't even heard the other three leave the room and had been too distracted by my surroundings to immediately notice. Oh, guys. I called out softly. For a few moments, there was silence, and then the sound of footsteps came from the doorway beyond. The footsteps approached the door, and for a microsecond, I felt yet another shiver pass through me. A dark figure appeared in the doorway, and for a moment, I almost felt afraid to lift the light and shine it towards them, afraid of whom or what I might see. But then I shook the apprehension from my mind and lifted my hand off the light. Johnny gazed at me, an even wider grin than usual spread ear to ear. He waved for me to follow him. Come on, he whispered. This place is freaking bonkers. I hurried behind him, stepping out of the room into a long corridor, which stretched away from us and out of sight. The other two were waiting for us, and we all now began to grin like idiots, as we collectively felt like we had as teenagers when we'd sneak into the movie theater to watch an R-rated flick at 14 or 15. It was the thrill of being somewhere we weren't supposed to be, and it brought back the feeling of being younger and, admittedly, more full of life. So, where do you want to start? Addie asked us. There's four floors to check out, plus the basement and we've only got a small amount of time for all of it. Johnny rubbed the stubble of hair on his chin. I'm thinking we start from here, then move to the upper floors. We'll leave the basement for last. Looking around, we all nodded our heads, agreeing with the plan. I pulled out the camcorder and handed it to Addie. You're the best at filming out of all of us, I told her, so you record everything. For the next 35 to 40 minutes, we slowly moved from room to room and from floor to floor. The others had also brought flashlights, and with each room we shone them into, we were rewarded with either an empty space, or occasionally, a few tables, and desks, likely left behind from its college days. Still, despite the slight disappointment the empty rooms brought us, we still eagerly checked out each room, speculating on what they would have been in the old days. This might have been the maternity wing. Addie whispered once we reached the third floor, aimed the camera into a particularly large series of room. This might have been where my mother and grandmother were born. Her excitement bolstered the rest of us, and we kept moving on, finally reaching the top floor. This floor seemed to have few walls remaining on it, and we walked from one end of the top floor to the other without much obstruction. As we reached the far end of the floor, something caught Lucas's eye, and he shone his light into a corner. Hey, check out this graffiti. He said, we huddled up around him and aimed our lights at the dark red letters spray painted on the wall. The wear of Dr. Craddock, Lucas let out a soft laugh. Holy hell, I'd almost forgotten about the legend of Dr. Craddock. He whispered softly, almost more to himself than us, but his words seemed to unlock a long forgotten memory in my mind. One of a story that the tour guide who'd led us around one year in the early 2000s had told only once, and for whatever reason, never told again. According to him, Dr. Craddock had been one of the head surgeons at Macaulay Hospital from the late 30s until the mid-60s, a man who was as gifted with his mind as his hands. He was also, according to the rumors, one of the most evil men to boot. He'd supposedly headed up many, if not all, of the unethical experimentation, even doing surgery without any anesthesia, as well as led other members of the medical staff in occult worship. The tour guide said that Craddock had been terrified of one thing, and one thing alone, death. He used the experiments, and occult worshipping to attempt to find a way to live for eternity, to escape the clutches of the Grim Reaper, and escape the fate which awaited him in hell. The tour guide had ended with, but it seemingly hadn't worked, as the man had died in the late 70s. My friends, also having remembered the story, were softly chattering to themselves about the message, but I'd stopped listening to what they were saying. As I'd mentally recalled the story myself, an odd sensation had begun to settle over me. 
one which I hadn't felt during our entire journey through the hospital, which churned and twisted my gut into a knot. It was the feeling of being stared at, the kind which attempted to burn a hole directly through the back of your skull. Turning away from the others, I looked back towards the other end of the building. With my flashlight lowered, I couldn't see much in the gloom, but I saw one thing. Many of the windows hadn't been boarded up, especially on this floor, and the yellow glow of the streetlights outside shone inside, casting long shadows and a dim view of the area. Over in the far corner was a shadow, one which was darker than the rest. That wasn't what drew my gaze and choked off my breath in my throat. It was in the shape of a person, one standing just out of sight. The feeling of being stared at intensified, and I swear I saw the shadowy figure take a step towards us. I quickly unhooded my flashlight, aiming it straight at the figure. There was nothing there. It was almost as if the beam of light had banished it away, if it was even there in the first place. As I aimed the flashlight around, I felt something brush against the nape of my neck, causing me to let out an involuntary gasp. As a lightning bolt shot up my spine, I whirled around to face behind me, the beam of my light splashing off my friends. As they turned to look at me, there was nothing there again. My breath came in short, ragged gasps, as I attempted to study myself. Dude, what's up? Lucas asked me. For a second, I considered telling them what I'd seen. Then I shook my head. Nothing, man I said, hoping my voice sounded calmer than I felt. Look, let's just finish up and get out of here, okay? I just don't want to stay in here too long, with God only knows what in the air. I saw Lucas and Johnny immediately accept my answer, but Addie lowered the camera and gave me a serious look. She knew something was up. She always did with me. I simply shook my head at her, letting her know I didn't want to say anything. Johnny finally sighed. Alright, then let's quickly run downstairs and check out the basement, and we'll book it. I let out a breath I hadn't realized. I'd been holding it, then nodded. Sounds like a plan to me, I said, then stepped out of the way as our friend led the way back downstairs. I brought up the rear this time, occasionally looking behind us and shining my light around. The feeling of being watched hadn't gone away. As we moved back downstairs, it seemed to almost follow us, staying just out of sight behind a corner or in a stairwell. I couldn't hear anything, but all of my instincts were telling me to be on guard. I reached under the waistband of my coat and massaged the handle of the hunting knife I had strapped there, feeling slightly comforted by it. Finally, we stood at the door to the basement. A set of steps, lined with a rusting railing led down. For a second, I debated on telling the others to hang the basement and just leave. But no, as creeped out as I felt, I attempted to be rational. You aren't being followed, dude. You didn't see anything. You're freaking yourself out over nothing. Don't ruin this for everyone else. And so, still repeating those thoughts to myself, I followed the others down the steps. The sound of water dripping from somewhere deeper still echoed back in the silence as we stepped off the final step into the bowels of the building, shining our lights around. We saw there were many rooms leading off in different directions. It almost seemed like a maze, in a way. Lifting the light, I saw a plaque mounted on the concrete archway. Surgical wing. Oh, that's great, Addie said sarcastically, spotting it as well. Have the freaking surgical wing in the basement. Johnny turned to us after staring out into the darkness for a second. All right, let's quickly check this out. He muttered softly. I noticed, for the first time tonight, that he seemed to be on edge himself. The excitement he'd shown until now had almost completely evaporated. Did he see something too? The thought swam through my mind. But before I could decide to ask out loud, he turned and led the way deeper into the basement, feeling as though ants and roaches had burrowed under my skin and were inching their way along beneath it. I hurried after them. The corridor and rooms seemed to go on forever, though they were all empty. The feeling of being observed and scrutinized refused to leave me, and I kept looking behind me, hating when I had my back to the darkness. Finally, I stopped. All right, this is far enough. Time to tell everyone it's time to leave, I thought. I opened my mouth. Hey, guys. They all stopped and turned to look at me. But before I could say anything more, all of our flashlights went out. And I don't mean they went out one at a time, even within just a few seconds of each other. I mean they went out at the exact same time, something which should be downright impossible. Everything was plunged into pitch blackness, one which I'd never experienced before. What the hell just happened? 
I heard Lucas exclaim somewhere off to my left. I don't know, where are you? Addie said, her voice now holding a noticeable trace of fear in it. As I heard them attempting to make their way to each other, the feeling of something brushing against the nape of my neck returned. I felt my heart begin to race, and my breath hitch again in my throat, and then my heart stopped entirely as I heard the sound. It came from just behind me and to the right, almost soft enough to miss, but not quite. It was a voice, a man's voice, low and gravelly, one which I'd never heard before in my life, and it seemed to hold more malice and evil in it than I thought a human's voice ever could. A decent subject. It whispered quietly, but not quite suitable enough. The brushing against my neck pulled away, and I felt my breath return, though in extremely ragged gasps, almost as if I were beginning to hyperventilate. What the hell? I managed to breathe out, turning around in a circle, and pulling the knife from its sheath. I shot it out into the blackness, slashing around, but feeling nothing meet the blade's swings. Who's down here? I finally demanded, finally raising my voice. Lucas and Addie stopped calling to each other at my words. Mike, what are you talking about? I heard Addie call out, the terror in her voice now almost as palpable as what I felt. Before I could answer, though, I suddenly heard her let out a yelp. Addie, I yelled, my voice echoing off the stone walls. I heard her begin to whimper and cry, but she didn't respond. A moment later, I heard Lucas gasp as well. Not even a hair's breath after, all of our flashlights flickered back to life. A second the beam returned. I whipped it up and looked in all directions. I saw nothing, no sign of anybody behind me. Turning back, I saw Lucas doing the same, as if he were looking for someone as well. Addie, though, she had crumpled against the wall, dropping the camcorder and covering her face with her hands. Sobbing loudly, I dashed towards her, kneeling down beside her. Addie, what happened? I asked but she simply shook her head and continued crying. I looked up at Lucas. Dude, what the hell happened? I demanded, a little more forcefully than I intended. For a moment, he didn't answer me. Then, he turned his face towards me. I saw almost all the color had drained out of it, and he wore a look of abject horror on his face. He looked down at the ground and muttered something quietly. I stood up slightly, keeping a hand on Addie's shoulder. What? Not good enough. I heard him whisper. Then he looked at me again. That's what the voice said to me. Not good enough. It said I felt my throat close up at his words. My breath again choked off. He heard the voice, too. Eddie stopped crying, and as I looked down at her, I saw her staring at Lucas with an even stronger look of horror than he wore. She said nothing, but she didn't have to. All three of us had heard the disembodied voice declaring us not good enough. For what? I didn't know, and I didn't want to know. I swallowed, forcing my throat to open back up, and forcing my voice out. Okay, we had our fun, it's time to leave. Now, both of them nodded at me, and I reached down and helped Addie to her feet. She locked eyes with me, and finally spoke. We need to get out of here right now. She whispered quietly. I nodded. Agreed I turned. Come on, Johnny, time to go. I said out loud. Johnny was gone. The area, where he'd been standing, slightly ahead of the rest of us and farther down the corridor, was completely empty of life. What the hell? Lucas muttered out, turning to look. Where the hell? I realized, with a start, that I hadn't heard our friend utter out a word since the flashlights had gone out. Not a word, and not a noise. Johnny. I called out, my voice again echoing in the silence, only broken by the dripping of water somewhere. No reply. Johnny, where are you? Lucas called out himself. Again, all we heard was the echo of his voice filtering deeper into the basement and back to us. Oh, screw me. I whipped my light around, finally looking down to where he had been standing. Footprints turned and led away into the darkness. Johnny's footprints. I recognized the tread of his hiking boots. Lucas spotted it as well, stepping forward and aiming his own beam down at them, then into the dark corridor. He turned back to me. What do we do? He asked me, his voice shaking slightly. Eddie grabbed my arm. Mike, we can't leave him down here, she whispered, her voice holding an almost desperate tone to it. Even still, for a moment I debated on snatching her up, yelling for Lucas to run for the exit, and simply calling the cops from outside. It'd mean we'd get in major trouble, but at this point, that might actually be preferable to the alternative. But I knew Addie was right. If it had been myself, or Lucas who'd vanished, our friend wouldn't leave until he'd found us, no matter how terrifying the situation was. 
Addie's right. We have to find him, then get the hell out of here, I said. Lucas looked petrified at the prospect of going deeper into the basement, but nodded. With Addie still clinging onto my arm for dear life, I slowly led the way down the corridor, following our friend's footprints. We stayed close to one another, constantly shining our flashlight beams into every dark room and corner we approached. The feeling of being watched was still there, but now it was much, much worse. It felt like dozens of people were all watching us, all with the worst intentions in store for us. Or not people, but other things. Trying to steal myself, I kept going, pretending I didn't hear the sounds. Ones which would sound like a foot scraping against the floor from a bend in the corridor behind us, or our fingernails against the concrete walls. Finally, we reached a larger than normal doorway. Aiming my flashlight up at the archway overhead, I saw another plaque. Operation Room. One major surgery. For some reason, those four words sent a new flush of fear through me. I hadn't wanted to admit it, but I'd begun to think of the building as a slumbering animal one which we'd accidentally woken up from our intrusion. And finding this room almost felt like walking, quite literally, into the belly of the beast. Swallowing hard again, I forced out a long breath and shone my light into the room. I was not prepared for what I saw. I thought that, like the rest of the building, that this room, too, would be empty. But it wasn't. What looked like an old operating table, long since taken over by decades of rust, stood in the middle of the room. Overturned medical carts of medical tools lay strewn around it. I spied rusty scalpels and sewing equipment littering the floor along with faded and rotting surgical masks. Aiming my light to the side, I saw many medical cabinets lining the sides of the walls. The entire room, if possible, gave off the worst vibes of the entire building. I never thought an inanimate object such as a room could feel evil before, but now I did, most decidedly. That was when I aimed the flashlight at the back wall. All three of us let out an almost collective gasp. Johnny stood almost directly against the wall, his back to us. I couldn't see his flashlight in either of his hands anymore, and he seemed to rest his head against the damp concrete. For a moment, I thought there was silence in this room as well, until a sound reached my ears, one which made my heart almost stop again. It was the sound of a voice talking fast, low, and quietly, but it was in a tongue I had never heard before, and honestly, one I don't think I was ever supposed to hear. It sounded, it sounded almost demonic in its tone and cadence. Another realization crashed over me, sending another lightning bolt of fear through me. It was Johnny's voice muttering, muttering a language I knew damn well he didn't know, for all his intelligence. That was when Lucas raised his light and aimed it at Johnny's back. Johnny, he said quietly. Instantly, the whispering stopped. Everything stopped. All sound in the basement ceased, including the dripping water. It was as if all sound had been sucked out of the basement entirely, and my ears began to ring viciously in the stillness, one which held the most terrible edge to it. That was a mistake. My mind raced. Calling out to him was a mistake. Then Johnny moved. He took a single step back away from the wall, straightening up to his full height. At 6'7", he towered over all of us. He twisted his head from side to side, cracking his neck with an almost sickening sound, and moved his shoulders, almost as if he were trying to get the feeling back into them, or get used to them. And then he spoke. Good evening, he said simply. My heart began to race at the two words he uttered. It had been Johnny's voice, yes, but it was wrong. The way he spoke, his inflection, and cadence were nothing like how I knew my friend to speak. It was as if someone else were using his voice to speak. Almost as if he knew my thoughts, he turned towards us, slowly. And this time, my heart truly did stop. Johnny stared at us, a smile on his face I'd never seen before, one which had none of his usual goofiness or happiness in it. This smile held only evil to it, evil and a sinister glee. That wasn't what made me clap a hand over my mouth to keep from screaming. It was his eyes, his usual hazel eyes were gone, and their place were bright green ones, ones which I knew instantly weren't his. I looked down, and with the largest pang of horror shooting through me, realized he was holding something, one of the rusty scalpels. Oh, damn, Addy whispered, causing our friend to let out a low, sadistic sounding chuckle, and then he was suddenly a blur of motion rushing towards us. I'd already slowly been moving, though, hoping he wouldn't see me trying to reach towards the door to the room, which had swung in. 
Moving almost as quickly as Johnny, I snatched the handle and yanked the door closed. Just in time, as well, I felt the impact smash into the other side. Looking down and knowing the handle would be seized from the other side in a matter of moments, I saw a piece of rebar lying on the floor near me. Lucas, I screamed, feeling the handle grabbed and attempt to be opened. Lucas saw what I was looking at and grabbed it, lifting the heavy object up and wedging it against the handle. The door shook violently and I could hear laughing emanating from behind the metal. Evil, insane laughter. I knew the rebar wouldn't hold the door for long. Run, I screamed, grabbing Addie and lifting her into my arms. Lucas didn't need to be told twice. We ran. We ran down the maze of dark corridors, frantically searching for the steps leading out. As we ran, I saw things appear in the doorways. Shadowy figures, all which stared at us. Some with dark, coal-like eyes. Others with glowing embers like what I picture hell to look like. A few reached out and tried to grab us, but we kept sprinting. I kept seeing more horrific sights, ones which I cannot bear to tell you. Behind us, I heard the crash of the operating room door break down. As despair began to well up inside me, we turned a corner and saw the concrete stairs, which led to our salvation. We took them two at a time, racing back through the ground floor to our broken window entrance. I practically flung Addie out the window before leaping from it myself. Lucas hot on my heels. We didn't turn back. We just ran down the street from my car. That night was five years ago now. All three of us piled into my Taurus and sped for the police station. Despite our horror, we still managed to decide that we wouldn't tell about what we had seen. All three of us knew we'd be labeled as nut jobs and likely end up in Oregon State Hospital. Instead, we decided to tell them our friend told us he was going to break into the hospital tonight and we were worried about him. We must have looked quite a sight, busting into the police station. They took our case seriously, though, I'm happy to say, and sent a few deputies out. They found nothing, no sign of Johnny, of my dropped camcorder, no sign of anyone. Even his car was gone from where he'd parked it. We didn't know what to make of it. It was as if our friend had never been there. The police promised they'd keep an eye out for him, but a part of me knew they'd never find Johnny, or whoever or whatever he was now, before we each went our separate ways. That night, though, the three of us made a vow. We would never speak a word to anyone of what we saw that night, let it die along with the building in a few weeks. Eddie said, tears running down her face for our lost friend. All of us agreed. We kept in touch the next few weeks, and all three of us went to watch the hospital get torn down a few weeks later. Seeing the building get reduced to rubble seemed to help the others, but for me, it just left an empty feeling inside. I couldn't push away the thoughts my mind whispered to me, telling me all the horror stories we'd heard over the years about the place had been real, far too real, and we'd almost become the final ones. After the demolition, I never really saw either Addie or Lucas again. They both left town as soon as possible, and I simply haven't heard from them since. I don't blame them, though. If it weren't for Ruby and my family, I would have left long ago as well. I still have nightmares, though. Ones which, as I said at the start, wake me up in a sheen of sweat. Of those shadows. Of my friend, rushing to try and kill us. Of running forever through that basement. The laughter getting closer and closer. And now I suppose I should tell you why I've told you all of this. Why I'm breaking a vow I've held for half a decade and change after so long. It's because I bought a newspaper while eating at the diner last week. The front page headline spoke about new doctors and nurses which had come to work at our local hospital, something much needed after a staffing shortage from the pandemic. The front page displayed some of the pictures of the newcomers and I froze, almost dropping my coffee mug as one face locked in my vision. A face I haven't seen in five years, smiling wide, almost in a familiar way, but not. One which stared out at me with bright green eyes. I felt myself begin to shake violently as I read the caption under his picture. The hospital welcomes Dr. Jonathan Craddock as our new head surgeon. 